Well, hello, everyone. As I said, my name is Donna Brighton, and I am absolutely delighted for our session today. We're going to be talking about set for success, best practices for virtual presentations. And it's my privilege to introduce to you Christy Royce, who is a colleague of mine. We met last November at the Northern California ACMP conference, and Christy was doing a fantastic presentation there. Uh, we stayed in touch, and I invited her to join us today uh, to talk on this very important topic around best practices for virtual presentations. So Christy helps leaders and teams recognize and tap their full potential, develop effective communication, collaboration, and leadership skills, and ultimately achieve higher levels of performance. She's a nationally recognized speaker and a seasoned facilitator whose unique mix of inspiration, motivation, real world strategies, and actionable steps brings measurable success. And so I'm thrilled that she'll be presenting today on the topic of presenting in a remote or virtual situation. So Christy, I'm going to hand it over to you. Welcome and thank you so much for sharing your brilliance with us. Thank you so much, Donna. It's wonderful to be here and with all of you. We are no longer going remote or transitioning to online. As we know, it has already happened and it's happened quickly. Maybe it's WebEx meetings. Maybe it's team meetings that you now need to use Zoom for. Maybe it's even one-on-one -on -one meetings because we're certainly not meeting at the local Starbucks for coffee right now. These meetings need special skills in order to keep your participants engaged and keep you engaged. I, as Donna mentioned, I frequently facilitate virtual coaching programs, whether it be one on one and with teams. And I have some best practices that I am looking forward to sharing with you today. We're really going to look at three different sections. Number one, how do you define and create the content that keeps your participants engaged? Secondly, how do you deliver so you are memorable and they don't forget you and they have some fun along the way? And thirdly, some quick best practices for how you set your practice up for success so you feel confident. How many of you have been in presentations like these before? Again, why do the presentations fail? I love this quote by Chris Anderson, who is the founder of TED Talks. He says, a successful talk is a little miracle. People see the world differently afterwards. Presentation is not to deliver content. It is really to move your audience. And that's what Chris is talking about here. How do you make those changes? So I'd like everybody to think for a minute, if you were to evaluate your confidence in delivering a strong, engaging presentation, rate yourselves on a scale of one to 10. Write it down, type it in the chat box, whatever, you've, whatever method works for you. Quick on a scale, one to 10, how do you rate your confidence? Because remembering in all conversations, you are the message. Words just support it. And it is a lot more than just what you say. It is how you say it. So Christy, so, if, if it would be helpful, we've got some participants. Joanne gave a number of seven. Jonathan said seven. Karen gave an eight. And Crystalyn said seven. Wow, you guys are great. That's Excellent to hear. So I would love to hear from some of you that, that are giving us these high scores and those of you in the chat box. Why do, Donna, why do some of, why do we see presentations fail? So Karen shared that identifying what is the message or messaging that's key to the audience. That's one of the reasons that presentations fail. So kind of understanding what resonates with them. Great. And Lainey says meetings fail because there isn't enough engagement with the attendees. Absolutely. They both are there. And, the, and thank you, because that ties right into the first 
subject that we want to talk about is how do you really define and create that content so that it is engaging? Because really conceptualizing what you want to say is the most vital part of the presentation. I always talk about if you don't have a map, you might not get to your destination and you've got to map it out. What are you looking to accomplish? How can you be engaging? Another great quote from Guy Kawasaki, and I love this one. He says, you may have a great business plan, a cool product, and you may even have some great employees and an excellent culture. But if you can't present and influence others with your ideas in an effective way, you suck. So think about that. How are we presenting in an effective way? So starting with really, again, clarifying this goal. What problem are you trying to solve? How do you want to move your audience? What is your intention? Developing that focus and that goal will allow you to determine what content you want to include. With that, what is your theme? Are you trying to influence? Are you simply trying to inform, educate, entertain, inspire? So content along with what is your theme will help you determine what you, what you want to include in that presentation. I have a great tool that I use in all of my talks, in all of my training sessions as well, and that's called the intentionality frame. So to use the example of today's presentation, my core goal or my focus was to help enhance all of your skills. So develop confident, capable presenters. So that is my goal. Then what I decide to do is how do I organize that content? And that what you'll see in the bubbles around that core goal are the subjects that I am including in the presentation. And then what it allows me to do is to be more focused in how I then lay out what that presentation looks like. Because I will share with you, I think the hardest part of any presentation, virtual or live, to be honest, is not what to include, it's what not to include. And this is a great format that really helps you to do that. Also, thinking about who is in the room. I'm sure that you all have gone through different assessments or different workshops to help you understand how to communicate with your people and with your teams. So really thinking about as you design that content, are people in the room outgoing and engaging or are they more reserved? So how are you going to then customize that content to ensure that everybody's needs are met? You're not going to include a lot of activities where you just have people raise their hands, um, even in virtual meetings, if people are, are, are more reserved. Another challenge I see in a lot of meetings is when people are mostly extroverted, everybody's raising their hand and they're interrupting each other. So really thinking about who is in that room as you are, de as you are designing that content. One of my also favorite approaches is to think about the why, the how, and the what. Why is about your introduction. Why should I care? If you do not quickly engage them in the first one minute of any type of communication or presentation, they're pulling out the cell phones and they're multitasking. So why should I care? How is about how will what you are sharing make my life better? How is it going to make a difference? So thinking about what content you include based on that. And thirdly, and this is where I see a lot of presentations fail, is what is the call to action? What will be different when we walk out of this presentation? So thinking about why should I care? How is the content that will make my world different as a result of this meeting, this training session? And what is the call to action? You gotta open with a bang. Say goldfish have the attention span of nine seconds, humans eight. So if, again, you've got to grab them quickly, especially critical in virtual meetings when you do not have the same sense of engagement when you are actually looking people in the eye and you can see how engaged they are. Also with virtual, think about organizing your content 
so that you ensure that what's most important to your audience is covered. Because frequently what I see is we're not as effective at managing our time when it comes to virtual. So make sure that you get that those top priorities first, just in case. There's also always a lot of talk about slides. Do you use slides in virtual? Do you not use slides in virtual? I believe slides are very important. And with virtual, the difference is you have got to use high contrast colors, number one. Number two, ensure that you have simple background so it's not confusing. Number three, and very important to have clean fonts and above 20 font size, if not bigger. I would say guns don't kill people, bullets do. Keep bullets out of your slides. Text boxes, as you'll see here by my slide support, text boxes work really effectively. Try to eliminate bullets and graphs if possible, especially when virtual. And lastly, look to make sure that the content is readable at a 50% at a rate because many times when you're delivering virtually, people are using smaller screens, they may be using small laptops, they may be using their phones, and they don't see your entire slides. So think about those best practices as you are developing your slides to support your message. Also with slides, they call this the picture superiority effect. Research proves that when you see this word, 10% of you will remember it 72 hours later. When you see this, 65% of you will remember this 72 hours later. And Donna, I bet that's especially true in Chicago right now as you're telling me when there's snow on the ground, you're probably not seeing too many sunflowers. <laughs> not too many. I'm looking forward to them for sure. So with all of this content, I can't discount the value of simply sticking to meeting basics. One of the things that I'm also seeing frequently with virtual meetings is we forget to go back to basics. Are you sending out agendas? Are you discussing ground rules? Are you reminding people not to pull out their phones and not to multitask? Are your objectives clear? Um, are you developing a handout that's going to help people follow along? So again, virtual or not, we can't forget to go back to those meeting basics when you are developing the content. So before we move on to how you really deliver, I also want to make sure that we touch on breakout rooms. For those of you that use Zoom, this is probably my favorite tool of Zoom. It really provides that so ability to socially learn when you feel like you're working next to each other. So their Zoom, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but Zoom has great, um, great videos on how to use breakout rooms effectively. A couple tips I will give you that I think are really important is number one, to make sure that you provide clear instructions of what the activity or exercise is you would like them to complete in their breakout sessions. I would encourage you not making breakout sessions too large. I think three to five is ideal and especially applicable when you have a large group of people. Really helpful just to, to uh, again, have that camaraderie and really applicable opportunities for them to practice and discuss what you are presenting. If we had more time today, I absolutely would have, would have introduced some breakout sessions. So in a, today, what I would have done is to have a breakout session. We put everybody in rooms of three or four and say, okay, what are your top tips and how you develop content for a presentation? Then what I like to do is select one leader from each breakout room and have them come back and share what was discussed. So it really makes that, that learning engaging and interactive. The other tool that I will add with breakout groups is you can pop in as the leader and provide guidance, provide feedback. And so it's actually like you are in a live training session and you're, you're popping around to each group. So breakout sessions, use chat, use, use the white screen, use polls, anything you can do to continually engage your participants will allow you to have a much better turnout and 
exactly all of the all of the best practices that we are talking about. So Donna, as we think about creating a bunch of zombies, back to why presentations fail. Any other comments that that have come in that you would like to share that might be helpful, especially as it as it pertains to content for the workshops. Um, well, she was shared that the ground rules you reminded of, us of are incredibly important during virtual meetings. So thank you for sharing that. And Christy, I just wanted to let all the participants know we're actually going to have a session immediately following this. So if you're interested, we can definitely try practicing some of those things you talked about in the Zoom rooms and give people that experience after we do this content portion of the webinar. Great. We'd love to have people participate there and love your feedback. So thank you for the reminder for that, Donna. Wonderful. So captivating with your close. Call to action. I talked about the why, the how, and the what. One of the complaints that I am hearing frequently from my clients is they walk away from their team meetings without clear instructions on what they need to be doing differently and or what the assignment is. So make sure as you are developing your content that you, that you have that clear closing and you find a way to engage with everybody so that they are very clear on what the next steps are. And you may need to follow up with an email and you also may need to follow up with individuals if they haven't quite bought into what the program is for next steps. So really make sure you spend some time on that. So you've developed great content, you're thinking about your audience members, you really know what you want to deliver, why you want to deliver it. Now let's talk about how are you memorable and engaging. Number one, ideally with virtual, use video. It helps make people feel like they're in the same room. It keeps them more engaged. Uh, as you are using that video, make sure that you are looking into the camera. One of, you also will hear from other people that you should be looking at all the different participants. I completely disagree with that. I, my best practices that I've researched and that I utilize is continue to look into the camera. Also, if you get distracted by looking at yourself, turn off your camera. I find that I am much more engaged when I don't have that, oh, what does my hair look like today? Or, oh, did my, ear, did my earrings match my outfit? You know? So think about turning off your self camera if you're using video and when you're using video. Body language, very important part of this. Communication is 7% words. It is 93% tone of voice and body language. So again, very important in virtual training because we can't always see the full body of what, how you were showing up in the room. So really thinking about movement. Is your movement distracting? Is it reinforcing? I frequently will use my hands to reinforce my, my communication. I may say I have four things I'm gonna talk about and I'll hold up four fingers. Move your hands around. Again, just so that it's not distracting, but work your best to show that you were engaged because it's more than just seeing your mouth move. Very important as you are thinking about where to sit or where to stand next to your camera. Again, research proves you should be approximately three feet back from your screen or your laptop. Pull out a tape measure and see if that works for you. Two and a half to three feet is what is ideal. And make certain that your entire upper half of your chest through your head is, is portrayed on that screen. I can't tell you how many, how many presentations I've sat through and I'll see half a head or I'll see too much head or I'll, so you've got to be really careful on where is your head placed within that screen. Also thinking about smiling. When you smile, your audience will smile. Talk about engaging. Again, these stoic faces that I'm seeing on a lot of these presentations and 
what can happen is we are thinking so hard about what we're going to say next that we don't realize that we have these zombie faces on. So again, smiling will be not only more engaging, but hopefully helping everybody else smile and enjoy. Voice. Be cognizant of your pace, your pitch, and your projection. Typically, when I am coaching my clients, I tell them, slow down. We typically need to, when, let me say this differently, when we are stressed, our rate of speech increases by 25%. And then people can't keep, keep up with what we're saying because we're talking too fast. Well, a little bit different in virtual. I do tell people to pick up the pace because when we talk like this, that's when the cell phones are going to come out. So talk quickly, pick up the pace. Again, I'm going back to really thinking about, sorry, too many there, pitch and projection. So vary your tone of speech. Pick up the pace and incorporate pauses. Remember, you know your content. Your audience does not. Allow them time to absorb it before you move on to the next subject. Take a breath. And laughter is the best medicine. Incorporate some fun. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Chat with yourself if you need to. But again, even if you're delivering what can be difficult messages right now, allow people to find some time to enjoy. You enjoy each other and enjoy the presentation. In delivery, it is so important and there's so many options out there for how to do that. So, getting near the end here, how do I help set you up for success so that you can practice and notice I say for near perfection, because we never have perfection. At least I hope we're not expecting that of ourselves, especially now when so much of this is new. But before a critical presentation, the best thing you can do is rehearse. Again, it makes sense, but we don't do it. And I'm not suggesting that you memorize every line, because when you do that, you're going to sound like a robot. But we need to leave room for spontaneity. But you also need to go back to that confidence meter and say what is going to increase that confidence. And that is absolutely practice. If you don't have a lot of time to practice, and if you want to focus on two key areas, what I really encourage you to strongly focus on is your opening and your closing. If you simply can memorize and invest the time to, to gain confidence in those two areas, I will guarantee it's going to have a strong impact on how you deliver. I also would encourage you to, in your practice sessions, think about recording yourself. I suggest you do simply an audio recording and listen to that and then if you can, if you have the capabilities do a video and audio recording think about how you show up i love this graphic because think about are you accepting an academy award that's what you should be striving for but invest the time to practice i don't know if any of you for, are familiar with amy cuddy's work but she talks about the power pose great, great resource. And her research tells us that putting your hands up high, stretching, getting your blood pumping before you do any type of important conversation or presentation will increase your confidence and dissipate some nervousness. So I don't know if it's jumping jacks or push-ups or you're simply throwing your hands up in the air, but before you walk into that meeting, get your blood pumping. 
Again, have some fun with it. Especially with virtually, virtual presentations. Again, how many have we sat in on where something goes awry? No, the video doesn't work. Somebody can't mute. We can't share screen. You have got to be technically sound and confident and limit those surprises. That's where all the practice comes in. Um, we were on this call, this, this webinar, an hour before today, going through all the nuts and bolts to ensure that everything was in order. Again, we forget to do that sometimes, whether it be a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a one to a thousand meeting. Set yourself up for success by limiting those surprises, especially when it comes to technology. And remember, we will all make mistakes. Practice doesn't make you perfect, but it certainly makes you more credible. I have an acronym for FAIL, F-A-I-L, Failed Attempts in Learning. Whenever you can, revisit your presentation. Learn what mistakes you made. Learn what you would do differently next time. Reach out to those that participated in your meetings and solicit feedback. We all can improve with every presentation we deliver. So make sure that you're soliciting that and learning how you do move from amateur to expert. So in closing, what do we do with all of this information? Uh, I, it sounds like there are many of you on the, on the webinar that have great practice and confidence in presenting. But what I ask you to think about is where would that confidence meter go now? Again, back from one to 10. I hope that we've taken it up at least 1% in this short time that we've had together. And one of my philosophies is always success without a plan is just an accident. So what is your plan for going forward? I believe very strongly also in walking away from any training opportunity with setting some goals for yourself. And the format that I like to use, we call continue, stop, start, and break. So on your handout, what I'd like all of you to think about is what did you learn today that you are already doing well that you are going to continue? So reinforces your current strengths. Secondly, what did you learn that maybe you're not doing so well you might want to stop? Thirdly, what new tips or best practices did you learn that you might want to start? And lastly, stepping outside that comfort zone. What's one thing that you might try on your next important meeting or communication? Continue, stop, start, and brave. What I have developed for a number of my clients at their request is a list of Zoom best practices. Yes, I mentioned that Zoom has great webinars and great um, training sessions. So what I've done is kind of condense that. And I think it's 30 best, tip, best practices for Zoom. Happy to share that with any of you. My email is here. So feel free to shoot an email to me and I'll send it over to you. Um, lots of great content that I think will be really helpful. And I want to close by saying, if you can make content that is pressing, that is relevant, that you, your delivery is varied and engaging, you can make online learning and meetings a wild success. And the way that you may be doing business going forward. It starts with competence, which is knowledge, leading to increased confidence, which allows you to gain greater credibility as a leader. And then you'll have the courage to be as brave as you can be going forward. So I thank everybody so much for your participation today. Would, would so welcome everyone to stay on for the next 30 minutes to practice some of these. I'm here to answer any questions, but I just wish everybody a wonderful day going forward. Go out and knock them dead.
Thank you so much. Thanks, Christy. Fantastic job. We so appreciate your uh, brilliance and what you shared with us today. Have a wonderful Wednesday, everyone. And for those of you who are interested, we're going to be doing another Wednesday webinar. So look for that in your reminder email as well. Have a terrific day and thanks everyone. And thank you, Christy.